Okay, so the first article. Yeah. Okay, so this first article was really all about um, communication, all about mm -hmm. student interaction, yeah. and trying to get students to talk. I had a few really good ideas about how to get students to talk more because that's a problem that a lot of teachers face when trying to do uh, something like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys think? Yeah, I think I really like like <laughs> very much on the peer interaction front of yeah. like uh, the importance that it places on peer interaction and the effect that it has on students, and then also I like the fact that it breaks down the parts into different subsections of you know examples of different ways to go about it. It's, and also discussed um, the. The, the choice of the, the teacher to also group students in terms of ability. They could either mm -hmm. decide to group students in groups where they might be in the same, I don't know if it's grade point or mm -hmm. just in terms of the English level, yeah. or they could um, change that and have the more advanced students work mm -hmm. with the weaker students, which helps the weaker students and then gives the more advanced students an opportunity to actually teach. Yeah, it mm -hmm. does and allows the, the like, uh, the less advanced students, the ability to make mistakes and learn from their mistakes without feeling the pressure to perform at the same level as like the higher uh, performance Definitely. students. Definitely. I mean, because there, I noticed there was this tendency for when a weaker speaker is talking to a stronger speaker, for mm. example, a teacher especially, there's yeah. quite a lot of anxiety there, but not, not about making mistakes and things like that. Yeah. Um, there's this one theory, the, the drive, uh, drive hypothesis, yeah. uh, where it, it talks about when you're feeling like you're being observed and being tested, you're going to do a lot worse because you're you're feeling that, that pressure and that stress, and which is affecting your ability to to make good output. Yeah. But also like how students talking to other students help each other figure out how the language works, how yeah. they can use language to express themselves. Talking to teachers or native speakers kind of um, yeah makes you <clears throat> listen more than you speak yourself because they put the words into your mouth all the time. Super. Sorry, what yeah. was the theory you just said? Uh, the, the drive theory yeah. from Robert Zanyosh. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. It just talks about how yeah you, you perform worse when you're doing something that you're not good at, and also feeling like you're being watched, being mm -hmm. observed, being assessed, which is what a teacher does. So yeah. having a student who is also strong and, and strong, stronger, and can also give yeah. that meaningful feedback is valuable. Although the Arbor article talked about some criticisms here about that feedback aspect and how. A peer to peer interaction might have less of that feedback than if it was a teacher doing it because yeah. the students aren't thinking about how can I help my peers learn because it's not their job to teach. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, one of the recommendations it made for the teacher was to um, to give some some sort of like uh, a guidance for the students yeah, yeah. about how you can give feedback and what that looks like and try to model that a little bit to inspire students to give feedback. Because feedback is very important. Mm -hmm. Having that. The return is on, on the input is very important. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a it, it very much the article spoke about like the teacher being an agent within that conversation of the peer to peer feedback of like engaging the students, uh, motivating them to speak, and giving them more direction rather than just as a social interaction. And also, yeah. one great thing about the drive theory is that um, when you're working either in groups, either peer to peer or teacher to student. Um, that is also that, that fear, that anxiety that students get when they have to speak in front of a whole classroom of 20, 25, 30 students. Mm. That's already minimized so much when you're in these smaller groups that students have more intrinsic motivation, they have more desire to, to try new things. And also, as you said, they're less likely to be um, yeah, afraid to make mistakes. They're, they're less vulnerable then. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And not, not just small groups, but they also talked about to switch the groups often in case there are some, okay. some students that maybe don't get along well yeah. outside of class or something like that, or or in case the, the, the mixed ability is too much or too little to challenge them. Mm -hmm. trying, trying to keep the, the, the groups changing a lot was something yeah. that they're having. Keeping in mind the social dynamic, especially yeah. I thought was important. Exactly. Yeah. And I really like how they focus on making everything like a real world, mm -hmm. more authentic for the students because yeah, yeah. the interaction they have with the teacher isn't really how it is outside yeah, the classroom exactly. and this yeah. is just making them um yeah developing like skills they really need in yeah. life yeah i mean it, it, i think that's also part of what small small flexible groups uh, mm -hmm. works towards because you're gonna be working in the real world you speak to a lot of different people all the time yeah. Uh, I think He has an article about talking about uh, developing social rules and how these sorts of social interaction things can help um, 
foster not just language skills but also just general social skills and, yeah. and learning to listen for register and, and trying to yeah negotiate meaning i think that, that was yeah. a big thing in this article is just try to when you're we have two peers that maybe are both not really strong in the language mm -hmm. they have to negotiate meaning and try to simplify and get different explanations and try to figure out what the heck the other person is saying because yeah, they're always important. like modifying their own language yeah, yeah. so they yeah, and tying, tying into that as well, they also brought up the jigsaw approach. Mm -hmm. So let's say, right. to, to give an example of when, let's say, students would uh, hypothetically be in groups of three, and you have some lower level students with some higher level students, mm -hmm. if they get given, which is an example they gave in the article, when they get given a text of something that might be more of a higher level text, mm -hmm. using this jigsaw approach, this gives the lower level students the opportunity to understand it more because you are discussing this text mm -hmm. with these higher level students and um, yeah that, that really helps push them up and really uh, helps helps push themselves out of their boundaries and learn more yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing with the article that uh, i thought was good because it did mention that integrating of writing uh, in with uh, language learning and speaking as a like integrated model of not just uh, focusing on one aspect of language learning but on multiple ones and allowing for a more natural progression and learning of language for a more like a use purpose instead of yeah i mean academic. that's that's the natural order hypothesis right there yeah. is, is like, like things that are important for conveying meaning will come before a lot of form-based learning which is what this interna interactionist approach really stresses um, yeah. going, going back to what you're saying about the jigsaw approach i really see that as like a type of kind of expert group strategy where it, it can take this kind of daunting task or tech in this case and break it down to these smaller sections and we uh, sort of adjust that input to make it more approachable for the for the new learner because then they can spend more time to think about it and to to read it and to talk about it with their group yeah as you said so the uh an example of how you could use this expert group slash jigsaw approach mm -hmm. is uh, as they discussed you could have this massive let's say a chapter of a book and you divide each page yeah. two different groups and then you have these expert groups uh dive in and really um explore that chapter and really develop it and understand and help these lower level students actually mm -hmm. understand the meaning of things that they wouldn't have been able to do exactly individually and then you have the groups together which is exactly what expert group is and then you can explain to the class so okay. you can really embed this into a lesson you could have a jigsaw um expert groups tied in together with this whole um classroom discussion which is really great yeah mm -hmm. and, and the fantastic thing about taking a, a, a text like that and breaking it down is you, yeah. don't, you don't have to find a simplified version because no. there was a, some study i forget the name that talked about how using oversimplified text can really reduce motivation because they feel mm -hmm. like this is not realistic this is not applicable yeah. to everyone it's also it might just not be interesting if it's always yeah. very simple words so to try to use original like l2 text mm -hmm. at the highest level and breaking it down like that is very handy it also allows for like the the n plus one uh kind of models of if the student has feels the ability to go beyond it yeah. has the, the all yeah. the students have the opportunity mm -hmm. to go beyond what the assumed level already is and, and it's that, better for the teacher to just like uh, give additional books or texts mm -hmm. with the same theme yeah. to help them kind of get into the more difficult texts yeah. Yeah, my, uh, my article was all about was also about reading, and it gave a lot of um, different ideas about how, what the teacher can do to facilitate what's called extensive reading, which was basically uh, usually using simplified texts uh, to allow students to really read a lot and to read quickly and to read for pleasure, basically. And there's a lot less emphasis on checking for understanding and, uh, and all that stuff because, like, like we discussed earlier, when you feel like you're being assessed, your enjoyment can go down a lot. Mm -hmm. So this extensive reading usually uses simplified text, but it also made a recommendation for the teacher to actually just take original text and when there's a word or something to uh, include some sort of definition. I think the example it gave was, it talked about like, um, uh, he's standing on the platform uh, at, the, at the station. And it's like for, for a new speaker, maybe they don't, they don't understand platform as train platform. So then if you talk about like, he's standing at the platform while the trains are going in and out, you can mm -hmm. add that little like extra clause to help explain within the text. Yeah. Additional context. With, without simplifying the text at all. It actually yeah. makes it even more complex, it makes it longer. So this kind of helps the learner learn without feeling like they're being spoken to like a child. Was there also 
um, in the article, did they mm -hmm. discuss freedom in choosing these texts, or is that all? Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. you, the whole point is that you're trying to get the, the the reader motivated to actually want to read just for fun. And yeah. So I think uh, this are my article. Which is very difficult for these yeah. elementary school of exactly. kids or middle school kids trying yeah. to learn language. Yeah. 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 So, so my article, also the second article that we had together, the one with uh, about level texts, um, yeah. really stresses the importance of the teacher building a very diverse library. Um, Jaldov and Peterson, in 2005, they talk about uh, how this teacher needs to really learn the students' identities and to develop a library of texts that gives everybody something that they're genuinely curious about. So extracurricular, could be curricular, because yeah. like, I think there's a lot of room here for um, teaching a, like a subject, what was this called? The quill, I think, right? Yeah, the quill, yeah. the content. content. Yeah, exactly. So like, uh, for example, as math teachers, we can mm -hmm. have just text about a math subject, but yeah. we could use all these cool extensive reading and level text strategies mm -hmm. to make this reading a, a language learning skill as well. So it's for, yeah. for, I think for me, this has a lot of great uh, implications. Yeah, it's kind of similar to what uh, my article also spoke about, where it's very much around student-centered uh, learning and student-centered uh, content specifically. Okay, like learner autonomy. Yeah, learner, yeah. learner autonomy and like uh, allowing the teacher to design the content around the students and letting the students themselves actually design and interact with the content itself. So, uh, God, what was I saying? <laughs> um, I feel yeah, in general yeah. it's important for mm -hmm. students to feel like their identities yeah. and cultures are being represented yes. in what they're learning. And it kind of carries with the motivation and everything they yeah. have to. Real applications allow for much more motivation for the students themselves. Mm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this motivation, I think, was one of the largest factors of success in language learning. So yeah. like, really fostering that is mm. huge. I think I think it was the, the, the one that we were talking about, the, um, the, the first article, student interaction article, where the teacher also has to um, model, uh, actually, no, I think it was my article. Model the interaction. Like to help not just not that, but to, to, to model um, what it looks like to be a competent speaker of a language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, give me a second. I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, 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 what I find course. like the most interesting in all of our shared articles yeah. is how they put emphasis on that like we have to help the students make themselves like see themselves as readers and mm -hmm. see themselves as um, competent language users and. Mm -hmm help them like look at themselves like more proficient users of the language yeah. and that helps with like giving them more challenging books and texts yeah or just giving them i think i think the art, i found it i think the article even talks about uh this activity for to have students go and find learners of this language mm -hmm. and to kind of get an understanding of like the fact that these people couldn't speak the language now can speak the language mm -hmm. and yeah. use the language in meaningful ways like for, I, I had a french teacher that always talked about how she uses the language to make these connections that otherwise she wouldn't be able to make. And mm -hmm. that, that gives a lot of motivation to students because it can be hard to motivate students to learn a language yeah. when it's mm -hmm. a language that's not spoken around where they're living or not spoken at home because they, yeah. they don't really need it in the moment, but maybe they can think, try to think in the future about when I could even use this in my future life, in my career. And that ties back into really understanding your students is what kind of career are they moving towards and how mm -hmm. can the language help them in that career. And also I had an article about interactions talk about instead of modeling, the teacher can give of themselves and like explain how their learning progress was and exactly. how they kind of mm -hmm. experienced language learning from yeah. and how, yeah, yeah, the progress they had. Very much just like using not just the learners but the teacher's life experiences, like yeah. input for all the content itself. Mm. Uh, again, it all ties back to motivation mm -hmm. as well. I feel like all of these things are something that's in hugely missing within the school context of without real world application of this very difficult to get student motivation and interaction especially for new learners as like if you're if you're just coming to a school and these students don't speak the language that they're trying to learn there's gonna be so much l1 usage which a lot of teachers can maybe we'll see as a really as a kind of a bad thing we'll try to to ban it completely yeah. i think the article recommends to to allow it in the, in the beginning yeah. to try to work around this. And I, the way I interpreted that was to really see L1 use as more of like a symptom of a problem and not as a problem itself. It yeah. just means that the students can't speak the language well enough. So help with understanding to right. make it better. Yeah. yeah, they need some other support to, to get them to that point where they can use L2 in mm -hmm. normal conversations because in the classroom. these activities that they're doing, let's say the reading and the, the writing and the discussing and the speaking, these are actually, a lot of times they're given prompts or articles that are actually for 
the native speakers and they are trying to push them push themselves and mm -hmm. use their their current knowledge to try to yeah to, to develop towards that level which is uh yeah, which is what they're trying to describe me for. Because that's kind of how my article comes into this with mm -hmm. how, yeah, like the gap between yeah. the proficient user of a language and the level that the student is or the learner is at themselves. And just noticing that gap could be motivational. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, you see how you have to get there, what is missing in your own vocabulary or. Yeah, and giving the student direction. Yeah. Exactly. It's very important that the student feels like there is a, a possibility that they can get to that point. They can see the path in front of them. If it's a whole mess of different grammatical concepts and so much to learn, and it's seemingly endless new content and yeah. rules, it will be very daunting. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um, going back to what you said earlier about um, you're talking about the these very difficult texts and these difficult articles. I think that's part of what the the level texts in the second article that we were reading together. Uh, talks about is trying to find texts that are more appropriate. Um, le level text basically just means that there every text is given some sort of score based on its perceived difficulty. Yeah. Um, there uh, there's a Lexile system which goes between like a one and a, and a few thousand. I, I prefer the the CEFR system because it kind of works a lot really well with uh, other skills like writing and speaking and, 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 and widely applicable. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's just more widely used for language learning. But this idea of helping to match a, a student with the sort of input that they could actually challenge them appropriately is really important, I think. Yeah, well, that's kind of links towards mine. Of, uh, in order to link with the student's content itself, um, my article kind of goes into uh, student-created content quite a bit. Yeah. And using that as, even though it has its flaws and it's less predictable, but using students to create their own content will create a much greater link to the students and uh, the content sure. itself. And it will already be at the level at which um, at, 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 that, that's, that's kind of challenging them enough and they can, yeah. they can exchange this with other students because, because some students will have skills in some areas and some others and yeah, that's, that's really mm -hmm. smart. I like that. I'm focusing on multi-level workshops as well, I saw yeah. that you have yeah, these multi-leveled uh, texts that you, you can use in a, in a classroom discussion as well mm -hmm. and um, a lot of individualized instruction formats like uh, the, the reader workshops Mm. Uh, which we were discussing before from even the, the first article um, we were talking about how you can have, yes, all these different leveled students um, and just have them all push each other. Yeah, yeah. and uh, another way to increase that learning autonomy that I talked about was um, in the second article mm. was to talk about um, how the teacher can, can have like a, a lecture or something going on during the independent reading period mm and allow students to kind of self-select if they want, if, if this is beneficial for them or if they, if they just want to yeah. keep reading, which is, is really huge for that, like, I actually want to read, that's sort of like, feels that motivation, or I need support, that's differentiation, then and then you can you can help uh, learners who need, who are help struggling with idioms or struggling mm -hmm. with literary structure or certain vocabulary, grammatical structures maybe that come from their text, we can just talk about that and give a very explicit lesson around a very implicit activity, which is reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ties into more of these like station activities. You can exactly. have this one main station, which mm -hmm. is the actual presentation from the teacher, and then the teacher can always give little side activities. If you yeah. feel like this is not benefiting you in the classroom, there can be a reading activity yeah. that they have to do. Mm -hmm. There could be a, a discussion that they can do, and you kind of have these workshops embedded in this one classroom. Yeah. So which, uh, yeah. Students can come with their text and they can present their text yeah. in the in the L2 language yeah. and, they, and they can try to inspire others to read their text and, mm -hmm. and to kind of to summarize it. And, and then you're sort of checking for understanding because but that, that's part of the criticism of, of my extensive reading thing is that there's really no check for understanding to check that these students are even Getting yeah. what getting the point yeah. of what they're reading because the point of reading is still to learn. It's still yeah. it's not just pure for fun. It's also there's definitely a learning aspect. Mm -hmm. So having the student give a presentation about it can can be helpful, um, yeah. although optional of course. Like it really should be something that they they want to share and yeah. they, they want to. That's and also a presentation is kind of yeah you give them owner ownership over yeah. the yeah. situation, and it's a nice way to assess their develop yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the and it makes the classroom more student-centered. It, it does. Mm -hmm. It is one one criticism would be that it's like you know, a lot of schools have to fulfill a specific curriculum and reach certain goals of yeah. passing certain exams, and so this definitely 
will have to be around that and somehow integrated within the classroom to keep in mind the purpose of the classes itself. Yeah, this is why like the teacher still needs to consider what kind of new vocabulary is being introduced. Mm -hmm. um, it talks a lot about enhancing the input and really maybe putting in bold the, the new words that are in a given text. Mm -hmm. So that you're not just giving students this extended reading text that they can do what they want with. You're also you're involved with the learning process. You're trying to make yeah. this a learning experience and to mm -hmm. to give them some sort of checking for understanding if possible. But at least not not just like a like a comprehension check quiz or something like that, yeah. that makes it seem very not for fun it still needs to be something fun that, that ties into uh, one of the articles i was reading where they didn't um they didn't go into detail on what type of quiz this actually was if it's actually like a summative or a formative quiz but it discussed a lot of short oral quizzes yeah. so let's say you had some um some homework you had to do um, then you would start the lesson with a short oral quiz where you just have a list of questions and you can ask the students and use that as a check of understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, ideally these sorts of oral quizzes would be yeah. in, in the second language. Exactly. Because then, then they may have to oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, use the language that they're given. But it's, it's difficult because that, that can be quite stressful to have to, to, to give immediate quick uh, rea reactions to questions in yeah. the language of learning. That can be a, a You could also do it in groups though. Exactly. So it's the peer or a student student yeah. interaction. Yeah. 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 And allowing the students to have time to process the, the information and the content they're learning and like right. without like Yeah, because that, that, that's one of the benefits of this student to student interaction was it it, it was just slower. The speed of the mm -hmm. conversations mm -hmm. were slower. So they found that there was there were more chances to speak for each student, more more chances to, to kind of reconstruct the knowledge in their brain. I think yeah. Saints which was yes. fifteen talked about how that the, they even talk with longer sentences because they mm -hmm. they aren't so stressed about the situations so they don't just answer with yes or no mm -hmm. they really feel like they're free to elaborate and to talk more which actually in the long run gives the, the teacher the, the learner more like more language that they can yeah. input yeah. they feel free to make mistakes and learn from them which True. is greatly enhances their learning and i also think it, in yeah. the article it said that when they're talking to peers they kind of yeah they have the time to come up with the yeah. things they learned in class so yeah. they feel like free to be like okay i know this and yeah. then use the knowledge rather than just be silent in the conversation yeah. with the teacher gain confidence and uh, gain Absolutely. more interaction within the classroom yeah. because of it yeah. Colin, i think what you were saying earlier about giving the students free to make mistakes is i think one of the key criticisms of this sort of thing because mm -hmm. there's still a lot of behaviorist idea about the fear of making mistakes and yeah. 2007 talks about how this I, this can really lead to bad habit creation and fossilization and sort of in, in, imperfect language uh, inputs from the students that they get from the other students could be something that kind of messes with the the correct output that the that the teacher is yeah. giving imperfect input imperfect input, output yeah. uh, hypothesis yeah it is very much uh, again it's very much linked to the behaviorist kind of aspect of it and I feel like in general exactly. education is moving further away from that and so it is becoming less of a concern yeah. but it is something we definitely do have to keep in mind. Yeah. Although I mean, I, I will say like my extensive reading is it works well with repetition and a lot with um, mm -hmm. because to develop because one of the benefits of this extensive reading of reading a lot and just in general mm -hmm. is you you get to notice grammatical structures and uh, which can uh, help improve your writing. Uh, Hafiz and Tudor noticed this and they they talked about how the this kind of grammar acquisition that happens requires a lot of input and mm -hmm. reading can be a really effective way to do that. I mean, this is. Uh, a massive, massive amount of input. Ideally, because the students will be wanting to read, they'll read for almost an hour a day if, if you really get lucky with so many students. And this is sort of what, what the audio lingual method suggests, yeah, yeah. which is also just a lot of input, a lot of like, let me listen to some speakers saying, let me let me read this, try to get um, as much of the correct language in me as possible. Because that's how my article is also focusing. They're focusing on giving the learner just correct input yeah. of language or target language and it's about if you're giving yeah a text that's above the level of the learner mm -hmm. yeah. and they notice the gap they notice the words they don't know or mm -hmm. how the language is formed and that way the input kind of forms to intake which yeah. is a big difference mm -hmm. like yeah. not all input is intake, intake yeah. for the learners yeah. and i think the teachers have to be conscious about that yeah, yeah. that's true this is this is the cognitive load idea where especially if you're talking about like quill or something like that or mm -hmm. these sorts of uh presentation like these are very co heavy cognitive uh tasks and 
trying to learn a language while doing all of these things at once can be maybe too much for a student. It's important to have a teacher to recognize that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, m more of this noticing, I remember, I think Richard Schmidt talked about this noticing hypothesis about really drawing attention to when something has been learned and, and making that key and, and I think yeah. enhancing the, the input and, and really making it clear what is new here, giving, giving these definitions explicitly can help the, the, the learner realize, okay, I have to pay attention to this, this is new. Yeah, yeah I First. think Schmidt, you said? Yes. Yeah. He also said like he experienced it himself, mm. how like of course you're surrounded by the correct language all the time, at least in some circumstances. And he said like the certain features of the language has always been there. Mm. It's not before he noticed himself that he acquired it. Yeah and internalized the, yeah. the knowledge kind of yeah perfect example of how the intake uh you know happens in yeah happens. Mm. that's true true and i think it's gonna be it could be smart to for the teacher to tell like when they're telling about mm. their own experience to yeah. tell about people like schmidt and who also had these kind of experiences with language because we are all we've all been there yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've done so far a lot of discussing about reading text and mm -hmm. acquiring language like that, which is a little different to my uh, personal article that I read. Mm -hmm. So that was all about flipping the classroom, mm -hmm. which um, basically what, it, what it, the, the flipped cl classroom approach is, is the quote unquote standardized way of teaching is often a teacher gives a presentation, gives a lesson, then gives a, some sort of practice to work on it. You go home, you do your homework, and you repeat the next lesson. The flipped classroom mm -hmm. approach is more to do with giving a presentation mm -hmm. or an activity, and then giving students the opportunity to actually discuss and practice what they're learning mm -hmm. through um, interactivism in the classroom and actually learning like that. So for example, um, let's say a student is taking any language course, French, English, anything, you have maybe a presentation on the past tense, yeah. and then you talk, you learn about the structure, and you learn about certain verbs, and then you'd have an activity of how you try to practice and actually um, illustrate maybe with a prompt what you've done in the past, and then you have these students in smaller groups discussing and interacting, yeah. and that gives them a lot more freedom. Um, rather than just sitting at home and copying something down where they can pull out Google Translate and not actually learn. So yeah. this is a yeah. little different to what we've been s discussing for the last... Yeah. Uh, but it play. also kind of, it has some relation or yeah. Like yeah. to yeah. Yeah. text, like the yeah. articles, because a lot of it is about the teacher role and how many teachers think that the only way to mm. have the, the students learn is mm. for the teacher to give them it, they input themselves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think this is like the, this, the whole PPP approach, right? Where the, the teacher does present, does it for them, but then you move into practice and family production, yeah. getting mm -hmm. the students to be more active in the learning. I think yeah. that's where education is going. And I think this flipped classroom idea, I think the, the learner-centered content really, and, and even the extended reading to an extent, uh, can help sort of facilitate making the learner more active in, in, in their, yeah. in their role. Yeah. So that does feel like it's a common theme between all of the like self-selected uh, uh, articles. Is it's very much it's about mm -hmm. enhancing the student's own abilities mm -hmm. to to like that take intrinsic motivation, motivation, intrinsic motivation yeah. and intrinsic yeah. um, interaction with the content within our classrooms. So that, that is what my article um, stated. Is that the number one most important factor when learning a language? is to have intrinsic motivation. If you don't want to learn, then you're not going yeah. to learn. Yeah. And I also think that, because in how languages are learned, mm -hmm. they say that the acquisition in learners happens when you have like the motivation there and you give them the sense of identity in what you, mm -hmm. in the content they have to learn. And it's about quality of instruction which comes down yeah. to like, yeah, flipped classroom yeah. is that better quality yeah. and then the teacher just yeah. teaching and all of these things. So I feel like all the articles kind of work on the same. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of Krashen's five hypotheses, is, yeah. which is to actually 
um, learn able to get exposed to meaningful content and mm -hmm. stuff that exactly. the student actually cares about Absolutely. and therefore they actually yeah they're more intrinsically motivated yeah. to actually and when the yeah. and, and when the teacher is the one organizing what's being learned mm -hmm. that kind of goes against this natural order of because yeah. what what comes next is still not really sure like it, it, it can change depending on just the culture of the classroom or mm -hmm. the learner's individual backgrounds mm -hmm. so for the, the teacher to organize this rigid structure of first we do simple past and then we do simple yeah. present it yeah. doesn't make sense mm -hmm. it's, but it's, i think when you make the student more active and you really listen mm -hmm. to what the student is struggling with and what they need to, what they need in that moment to communicate really fast Fostering that natural order hypothesis, yeah. you can design a curriculum that much more enriches, like that enriches the order which is being learned. Makes yeah. it makes it more useful, makes it more relevant to the immediate need of, of the learners, which helps motivation. Yeah. And yeah. I, I have a question for you guys. So, based on the critical period hypothesis, which states that um, it is easier to acquire a language when you're in, let's say, when you're prepubescent in your prepubescent ages, when you're mm -hmm. let's say elementary school, middle school. Do you think that this changes uh, when, you, let's say, you're in a high school French class or something? How do How do you guys mm -hmm. think that that changes this yeah. this this um, strive to get the student motivation? Well, that's it. I feel like the student motivation only really becomes an applicable thing you can like interact with in a meaningful yeah. way as an older stage within like high school. Yeah. Because within like the critical period when they're younger, it's a lot more of a base motivation, and you as a teacher will have uh, you'll have to like interact with them on a more simple level and less of a metacognitive metacognitive level. Mm -hmm. Like you can't get them to notice the gap as much at an earlier level. You mm -hmm. can't get them to do like all this extensive reading, all these other yeah. things. Yeah, it's, it's very much limited based on the cognitive load that they can handle. Well, if we're talking about like student interaction, mm -hmm. there's an argument made that an older learner will have only more uh, tentative to how they're perceived by others mm -hmm. and. And that could actually hinder the, the ability for them to speak. They're, they're less brave to, to make mistakes because mistakes are, are huge, I think, for language learning. And, yeah. and these older learners might be too hesitant. They want they really want to be perfect right away. When they're when they're having these peer to peer conversations, they can still be thinking about is my pronunciation good, which is totally not the point of these peer to peer conversations. Yeah. It's all about meaning. It's all about yeah. the, the the content and less the form. So. Yeah. A, yeah. The whole puberty thing of trying to be cool and not make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And as you yeah. learn language, yeah. you make more mistakes as yeah. you learn. Yeah. So it's a natural part of it, and students will not be able to understand that on an like, emotional level. There are other things that I, because a lot of these articles gave a, many, many cool strategies for how to, mm -hmm. like, yeah, just teach. <laughs> and when you're older, a lot of learners have their opinion on how they best learn yeah. and what strategy strategies they want to use and that opinion is kind of nice to acknowledge mm. as a teacher definitely there's this mentioned in an extended reading um article as well because a lot of students will not feel like they're learning a lot when they're reading text that is at their level when yeah. that's not challenging them actively the whole time they're reading it mm. because they're used to being uh, really fatigued by new language text. They're, they're really used to having to sit there and think, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? And going through the same sentences. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Which is, and, and when they're reading something that they're comfortable with and, and enjoy, maybe, maybe thinking, well, I'm not really learning much, that is not useful. Mm -hmm. So you're right, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. The students are, are able to think about what works best for them. Yeah. And maybe even better than the teacher, arguably. So this is another argument for, especially as students get older, to really let the, the teacher be more of a guide, someone to, to provide yeah. the text, to provide the, the, the flipping of the classroom, yeah. to, to organize these yeah. activities and, and to make the atmosphere of the classroom yeah. and the environment for yeah. Yeah, yeah. Learners environment to, for learning, to use the stress, to, develop, to, to, yeah. to model yeah. good behavior, and model good feedback, model good yeah. reading, model good. Yeah, yeah. And yeah the teacher role well. is just yeah. different than how we often mm. in, yeah, think of it. So I, I still think in, in primary classes, it probably is still does require a lot of teacher-led yeah. stuff because mm -hmm. these students don't have, don't have as much of that student agency, don't have that much ability to command and take mm -hmm. responsibility for how do I learn best. That's yeah. something that these yeah. younger students are just not ready for. Yeah. yeah. Good thing we're secondary teachers. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. um, I feel like there's also a lot more implicit teaching when you're in elementary mm -hmm. school and middle school. And when you get into high school, teachers often try to teach more explicitly so try to foster either an activity or a discussion and then maybe tying it into something else so mm -hmm. let's say 
uh, talking about the past tense. The teacher mm -hmm. can start with, oh, what did you guys do last weekend? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, asking them questions about things that happened in the past. And then with that, they can tie that into, um, yeah, by explicit or implicitly teaching yeah. that they uh, know yeah. what, what the they're doing. rules, exactly. Past tense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of unfortunate because I think even the, the older students can still benefit from that sort yeah. of like, mm -hmm. what did you do this weekend? Tell, yeah. me, tell me about your dog or whatever. What's your favorite, favorite ice mm -hmm. cream? Yeah. Just to get them to, to output. So yeah, finding a way to make this seem less goofy and less childish is really important yeah. as, as we're teaching older yeah. students because yeah. you, they still have to be able to do those things. Yes. Yeah. So to get some they, corrective They feedback. cannot just have like lecture after lecture and expect to learn the language. Yeah. It seems like that doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think we've discussed pretty much everything. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have any points. Else. Anyone else have any questions or anything about anyone else's article? Or anything you want to mention about your own? Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was kind of wondering about your um, these activities that there were that the, the teacher is leading in your article. Yeah. What sort of activities um, does that include? Um, Do you give any recommendations on on the, the teacher's role and, and on? And, I think you talked a lot about grouping and things like the, that. There was a big uh, focus on technological tools used in this flipped classroom approach. So um, it, it also discussed mm -hmm. that in this day and age, there's more increasingly, or there's increasingly more implementation of these online tools. So it also tied into the fact that you can have these, um, these teachers uh, presentations or lectures and then tying that into an online tool afterwards, which also incorporates all the students. Mm -hmm. So where you have these online tools where students can either be anonymous on the board and you don't know who's actually um, inputting their answers, mm -hmm. but you can still see, uh, for example, I know in quizzes, you can have all these anonymous, anonymous names, but you can still see the, the spread of who gets the right answers, mm -hmm. who gets the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And then from there, giving students more um, freedom to, to, to discuss between themselves and actually. True. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, you mentioned uh, noticing the gap in your article. Could you explain a bit more about like what the gap is exactly? I think I understand it, but just yeah. more information would be nice. So the gap is basically like the gap between the observed input mm. and the learner's typical output. Yeah. So just what I found fascinating about my article is how they talk a lot about the gap and how learners receive information and how they kind of how their cognitive development is and how they notice things. Yeah. But it's also a lot about how the teachers should be like self developing their teacher role. So a lot of teachers are very like, this is how I teach and this is how it's going to be forever. Yeah. But a lot of them has to recognize their own teaching patterns and then kind of develop with the students. Mm -hmm. And they also have this gap that they need to notice. Within the teachers themselves. Within yeah. the teachers themselves. And I don't know how it would kind of affect this mm -hmm. article because <laughs> uh, a lot of it is done in Nigeria yeah. and they haven't done this research about the gap. Uh, in any other way, as it says, yeah. um, so it could be other, like it could be different in Europe yeah. and yeah, how yeah. it is here, because the teachers in Nigeria had didn't have the proficiency of English mm. level that they do in other countries. Yeah. So it could be a difference. Yeah, I mean, I still think that there are meaningful conclusions they can take about um, yeah. about being in touch with their students and, and yeah, like listening to what they need and still. Yeah. Still keep up I, th I think it ties back to, to the, the mm -hmm. what you were saying kind of about these these online tools that yeah. can help us like as affirmatively assess the whole class instantly mm -hmm. and that's really important if, if we're going to give students more control about the learning is and, and well, that have the teacher step back and be less involved is because mm -hmm. the teacher still needs to make sure that you know such and such student is is getting what they need mm -hmm. and being able to assess that without being too controlling and not being too mm -hmm. uh, stressful but like, like, like yeah. informatively and online and anonymously is, is massively important as, as we move towards yeah. that. To be more facilitator rather yeah. than lecturer or any sort of the type of teaching. Right. And to develop the, the question you actually asked me before, I looked through it and there was actually a specific example 
uh, from Diaz from Columbia University in yeah. 2018, where he um, discussed using a Kahoot uh, at the start of the lesson to access or test the student's self-study um, ability. And then from there, the, the students have more activities based or involved in writing throughout the lessons and then had more of the uh, flipped classroom approach. Um, and th they did bring up as well, there are, there are four pillars of the flipped uh, classroom approach, which are one, a flexible environment, two, learning culture, three, international content, and four, being a professional ed uh, educator. So these are the, the four principles mm -hmm. from uh, the flipped classroom network of 2015. Mm -hmm. I mean, flexible environment, that talks about yeah. the, the, the <clears throat> shuffling the groups that we're talking about yeah. earlier. Yeah. Uh, learning, what is it, learning culture? Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's really the teacher's responsibility to model what that looks like, to be mm -hmm. to be good readers, to be good communicators, to be good feedback givers. Mm -hmm. uh, international content, that's all, again, just like trying to find things that are relevant to the students, which is mm -hmm. going to be international students, so especially relevant for us because we have to find something that's not just relevant to the Netherlands if the school mm -hmm. is in the Netherlands, we have to find something that's relevant to all of our students. Mm -hmm. To the larger international culture. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I also think like the, um, online tools you're talking about or the flipped classroom is very useful for the teachers to just collect the answers and knowledge of their students but then you kind of you could notice things in that yeah. lesson but you could also just wait to the next lesson and then you're it's kind of contributing to contributing to the learners readiness mm -hmm. to acquire the knowledge so mm -hmm. yeah just noticing in one lesson and then you take it in another lesson it could be useful yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's an important role of a teacher for sure to adjust and to, to take what happened in the last class mm -hmm. and, and to try to mm -hmm. yeah to be active and not to be so set in, mm -hmm. in, yeah. in their ways. I think it's like differentiate not just between the individual learners but the different classrooms that you have as a for whole sure. for sure this is something i think we all notice in tp is even though we have classes maybe that are, that are the same class they're drastically different yeah. just with the student makeup and the culture of the social the interactions between them. Yeah. 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 And they're they, aware they, of like the, the readiness of the students yeah. when they're ready to acquire. And as we, as we move away from teacher led and more towards student led, these differences might become even more pronounced because the students will have a lot more control about how the class is able to learn. Yeah. So yeah. The, the teacher needs to be aware of this and really differentiate her class. And yeah. that also ties into the whole flip uh, classroom approach. Um, yeah. Which the, the the main actual idea of it is that the the classroom time could be wasted if you're just let's say giving a sixty minute presentation yeah. on the past tense or the present tense. So that's why it's really important with the flipped classroom approach is that you do most of the learning out of the classroom. You have yeah. these activities at home that you yeah. work on. You learn that content, and then the main. Um, the main use of the classroom is actually to apply the knowledge that you learned before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Ex extended reading is the same, just trying yeah. to get students to do language activity outside of classroom. Yeah. I think How Language is a Learner talk talked about this. It talks about how the difference between learning in a classroom and learning mm -hmm. at home may be the critical period, maybe a lot of the other things, but it could also just as well be like the amount of hours you're spending learning. Mm -hmm. And if, yeah. you're, if you're immersed in a culture where you're exposed to language all the time, yeah. that's a lot more hours you're spending making anything other language than if yeah. you're going to class for five hours a week and yeah. nothing else, maybe like 20 minutes yeah. of homework or yeah. something. It's nothing. That's, that especially, uh, Marta spoke about as well, especially in uh, European countries that have become more anglicized yeah. over time, where they'll be exposed to far more English media and like just ex English experience yeah. in general outside yeah. of the classroom than any amount that you could possibly have Definitely. within the classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just go back to how in tune the teacher has to be to what the students are actually seeing. And, yeah. and, and maybe they already know a lot of these things and, and how can you use what they're doing to try to yeah, get them inspired. I think I remember in, the, in, the, in one of the, I think it was the second article talked about this type of uh, mm -hmm. text that exists where it's all about like instant messenger kind yeah. of plot. I think the thing is, this is my article, sorry. And um, these, these are like stories that were told, but like it was like text message chat mm -hmm. and kind of like mm -hmm. read through it, like it's just that. Yeah. But like, it, yeah. it, 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 it aligns with their culture. Exactly. Yeah. It creates like authenticity. It, 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 it gets them excited and, and it yeah. helps the students connect to it. It sounds, yeah, yeah. yeah. like these things in the future. Maybe not this specifically, because I think, I don't know. I'm not sure how much <laughs> high quality reading is, is there. <laughs> but maybe, and maybe I need to read some of that myself. Yeah. But if, with the, the online tools and stuff, <laughs> all the games you can play, yeah. 
which yeah, it's just, aligns it's, with the curriculum of the subject. Definitely. It's just, yeah, it's a lot of them. You know, there's an insane amount of available tools, more being yeah. made, more resources for English teaching than pretty much yeah. any other content. Yeah. And definitely. also with the reading, because a lot of reading nowadays happens online. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And even they're, though you're like, yeah, you have to have this yeah. book. They're not novels, they're not poems, they're going to mm -hmm. be articles, they're going to be uh, Twitter threads, they're going to be like these really things that are very unfamiliar and are not yeah. so easily accessible from mm -hmm. an academic level that we need to adjust to. You know, yeah, and even if it's with. online, it could be a full vocabulary you have yeah. to see. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like yeah. what you said, with, uh, you know, the teacher has got to notice their gap in the content, not only of that, but like as the technology is used by children mm -hmm. advances. We're just going to have to keep up with that yeah. and keep yeah. all the content yeah. applicable. Let's not be afraid of technology. Let's use it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which is, yeah, my the article that I read yeah. also really um, emphasized the importance of out of the classroom using this technology because, yeah, as I said, with the flipped classroom, the start of the lesson is typically, yes, a presentation, mm -hmm. but a short overview mm -hmm. of what you had gone over at home. And then what you've gone over at home is often either um, in this article, they, they emphasize using online tools, yeah. which also enhances the student's motivation to actually do the work. If it's a game or an activity that they have to do in their own time, yeah. that's a lot more enjoyable than just working on a worksheet. Yeah. Yeah. So tying into, yes, the intrinsic motivation and technology with this flipped classroom approach, you have one, the students more vo motivated to work at home. Yeah. You learn at home, you apply that in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. You start with a small presentation and then you can have a an activity or you have these students discussing yeah. um, get feedback exactly yeah. feedback and yeah and just a lot of these things is about the students being comfortable with what they're doing yeah. and being comfortable makes you more proficient usually because you do it more frequent frequently and you just yeah you you do more of it yeah. and that's the thing definitely um mm. Yeah, I mean, I think for most classrooms, there are exceptions. There are so, some classrooms that really are all still around passing tests and things like that. And there's value in knowing how to teach those. But I think for, for maximizing language learning, yeah. language you know, language is, 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 is communication, interaction. It is uh, the ability to speak with another person. Yeah. And that has a lot of these, yeah. these very valuable things that we need to inspire yeah. our students to, to want to do. That, well, that's it. even within the classrooms that are very much uh, exam focused and results focused, you can still integrate the true language in it, like the curl and, uh, you know, it's just language permeates all aspects of education, especially in international schools where yeah. almost all students will be learning in the, uh, you know, second language. It's kind of what I didn't get with one of the articles, uh, that anxiety part of talking with the teacher. Mm -hmm. I get, I get that, but then they were also talking about like students feel feeling anxiety um, or concerning about like talking to native speakers of yeah. the target language. And I feel yeah. like using native speakers or just something native like is usually a motivational kind of yeah. feature in the classroom. I feel like it's different based on like cultures of you know, yeah. uh, based on like what language you're learning, what the native mm -hmm. speaker is, and. The, just general context of it all because I've had experience of you know people being very nervous to talk to me as an English native speaker yeah. and other people who have very any English knowledge wanting to talk and learn and it's just individual difference. Yeah. This also relates to the the critical period hypothesis that if let's say if you're at the age of high school or if you're in high school and you're speaking to a native speaker while you're mm -hmm. not I understand that some students may feel stupid or they don't they don't feel like they're at the same level as yeah. that native speaker so they're afraid to speak up because they feel like they are making um these small mistakes that the native speaker would have made so i do yeah. understand yeah. that because you do feel like you are levels below mm -hmm. that yeah. native speaker yeah depends on how you're yeah. uh, but it's yeah. different cases for different. each students obviously mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to go back to what you said about international schools mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what a wonderful, interesting language environment that is. Where yeah. We have so many different, I mean, I've been at schools with, with 80 plus nationalities at them. Mm -hmm. It's like, how many languages do you have there? It's over 100 probably, yeah. Yeah. right? So, 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 so many different unique languages to pull from, so much to get excited over. And yeah. I think the role of the teacher will really be to, to model that sort of excitement about about uh, their experiences as a language learner, their reading, their the, the way that they are able to communicate with people, 
kind of modeling that and getting your students excited and uh, motivated because there's so much it, it, to be excited about with, with learning mm -hmm. language. It's a really, um, you know, this, this is a, the unique human experience. Mm -hmm. Let's take advantage of it yeah. <laughs> and, and give our students a chance to do that. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that uh, a I would say nice that, way to run your run, run. Yeah, it's <laughs> a very nice but conclusion. So, um, I'll, I'll take notes. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks <laughs> all for, for the future. Thanks all for reading your articles. It was really fun to read. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Look forward to a fantastic time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun.